In our nugget in this course entitled Meet Your Default VPC, we took a look at the components that make up your virtual private cloud, specifically the default virtual private cloud that we have in AWS. As you might guess, it's time for us to create our own virtual private cloud components inside of Amazon Web Services. Now, before we dive into the VPC creation work, just a quick interface tip for you. Notice when we go to the main AWS services page, they're doing a nice thing for me. They're keeping track of recently visited services. And certainly one of those is VPC. We could find VPC under all services. If we look at the networking and content delivery area, when we expand all services, but there's something else that we can do to make it easy to get to stuff we're gonna use all the time, and that's use this pin area right here. If you click this pin, you'll be able to go down, find VPC, for instance, and pin it so that it's available right there from the top interface for us. So we're gonna go down, grab VPC, and then scroll up and drop it right there into this area. So now, anytime that I wanna work with my VPCs, it's gonna be simple to do that. So let's go back to services and then let's click on this new VPC button that we created in order to get to the virtual private cloud configuration area. So the goal for you and I in this nugget is to go ahead and create uh, some subnets in our VPC. In fact, we'll create our own brand new VPC. And what we'll place in this VPC is a public subnet and then we'll place in there a private subnet. This is obviously for stuff that we want accessible freely from the internet. <laughs> I shouldn't say freely. We'll lock it down to just what they can get to, but you get the idea. It'll be publicly accessible, and then stuff that we put in the private subnet is for resources that we don't want such access to. We'll do this using the VPC wizard, and then what we'll do is we'll go in and we will create another public subnet and another private subnet. And I'll show you how to do this manually inside the interface. Of course, our hands-on lab together here wouldn't be much fun if we didn't insert some services that we could use for testing. So we'll do that too. So we're going to initially start with the VPC wizard. There it is. And notice when you go to the wizard, you're going to have options down the left-hand side, like a very simple VPC with a single public subnet, a VPC with public and private subnets. Oh, that sounds good for us. A VPC with public and private subnets and hardware VPN access. We'll certainly be covering something like this in an upcoming nugget where we look at the many different connection opportunities that we have inside of AWS and then a VPC with a private subnet only and hardware VPN access. Great stuff. So let's go to VPC with public and private subnets and choose select. So what's happening here? We remember when we were examining our default VPC, they used address space in the 172 range. You remember that? Well, it's no surprise that they switch over to 10.x when we're going to create our own, let's call it just quote unquote, custom VPC inside of Amazon Web Services. So that's kind of slick. They go to more private use only address space and they give us the 10.x range that they're going to use. Notice no IPv6 is going to be in place by default. Now, should you want to change the private address space that they gave you, you're more than welcome to do that. And notice they're giving you a slash 16 block. So right off the bat, they tell you, you can have 65,531 overall IP addresses using this slash 16 mask. Notice for the public subnet, they're doing a 24 bit mask, giving you 251 addresses. And for the private subnet, they're giving you 10 zero one slash 24, which again gives you 251 addresses. Please understand all of this can be manipulated. For instance, for your public subnet, if you say, well, that's total overkill. I want to go ahead and extend the host bits to, uh, or, or diminish the host bits. I should say, extend the mask to 25 bits. Then you could do that. And notice you'll now have 123 addresses available. So keep in mind, all of this is flexible. We keep it all to private IP addressing. And you might say, well, wait a minute. If it's all private IP addressing, how can there be a public subnet? Well, you already know the answer. We'll do network address translation, for instance, for the private subnet so that resources inside the private subnet can communicate through and 
access the internet. The public subnet we know is automatically connected to an internet gateway so it can get internet access. We saw that in the default VPC example. So even though it's private IP addressing everywhere, we can solve network connectivity. Let's go through this and fill it out, shall we? For VPC name, I'll go ahead and say sys ops, and then we'll say hyphen first VPC. <laughs> Here we go. Now, notice I use all uppercase. You don't have to do that. I like to do that when I'm naming things so those names that I have applied stand out. We'll go with their recommendation for the public subnet IPv4 CIDR range. And for an availability zone, this is cool. We can place it in our region of North Virginia in the 1A availability zone. So the public subnet is in that availability zone. Notice the name public subnet is the default. Let's do better than that. Let's say sysops and we'll say public subnet one, and then there's the private subnets range of 1001. The availability zone, we'll stick this one in the same availability zone as the public subnet. And for a name, we'll stay consistent. We'll say sysops hyphen private subnet one. Now, what makes the public subnet public? Well, we remember from looking at our default VPC, the public subnet is going to have access to an internet gateway. What would allow resources to be available in the private subnet if we wanted them to be? Well, that's where network address translation comes in. We can use a NAT gateway, or more commonly, you can click this link to use a NAT instance. So now you literally have an EC2 instance that will be doing network address translation for you. Notice you can pick an instance type. We know like M1 small would be for smaller environments, where C1 extra large would be for massive environments. We'll stick with the small one, and we have a key pair that we can use of my key. Uh, remember, you and I created AD server together, but there's one that I had created for purposes like this of simply my key, and we can assign that. Notice we are going to enable DNS host names, and what hardware tenancy is all about is we could pay extra to have Amazon Web Services dedicate hardware just to our VPC. That is going to be an extra charge, and we don't need that for this example. So we complete this form, and we say create VPC, and it creates our virtual private cloud with these parameters. And think about it. We've set up NAT, so if we wanted to make something available in the private subnet, we could. We know automatically they're going to give us an internet gateway for the public set uh, subnet, so we are really all set to go. Notice the NAT instance is taking a bit. That's expected, isn't it? Because they're spinning up an EC2 instance for the purpose of NAT. We'll say OK regarding the creation of our VPC, and there's our wonderful SysOps first VPC parked right next to the default VPC that they gave us. Now, we certainly want to spin up a resource in this VPC and make sure everything works, but I can already think of a problem that we might have. Let's go to our subnets, and in the subnets area, let's go to the public subnet, and let's take a look at the summary page for the public Public subnet. So look at this. It's 10.00 slash 24 as we knew it would be. Its state is available. It's in our first VPC. There's 250 available IPs. There's a routing table. Great. There's a network ACL that's very permissive that was created. It's in the right availability zone. Ah, look at this. Auto assign public IP information. This is disabled by default. So we don't have any public IP addressing that we can use to get to resources inside of the public subnet. So it's a misnomer that it's a public subnet right now. It really isn't. We can fix this with ease. Watch this. We selected the public subnet. We'll go up to the subnet actions, drop this list, and we'll say modify auto assign IP settings. And we'll say, look, Enable the auto assignment of public IPv4 addresses. We'll say save, and it says successful. 
We'll say close and we can see that yes, we're now going to be automatically assigning public IP addresses inside of that subnet and now we're ready to spin up a test instance inside that subnet. So we'll head over to the AWS services page and go to EC2 and let's use the launch instance wizard to bring in a web server to that public subnet. So we'll go with the Amazon Linux AMI. This is a variation of Linux by Amazon, how cool. We'll go with the T2 micro image, that's gonna be just fine, and go to the instance details. Let's give this instance a VPC of our SysOps first VPC. Let's go with our public subnet one. We're going to use the subnet settings, which is to auto assign the public IP. We won't do an IAM role. In fact, we won't manipulate anything more here except for the fact that I want you to add a bash script. How you do this is you go down under the advanced details and you can get this bash script in the supplemental files. It's called webserver.txt and this will install a web server on this instance and start that web server. Awesome. So we'll go to the add storage wizard next. Notice we'll just go with the default storage. We'll add our tags. Always a good idea to tag stuff. So we'll add a key value of name and we'll call this sys ops web server. Great. And then we'll go to our security group. We'll create a new security group called sys ops web server. And this security group, notice, is allowing SSH access to the instance by default. Great, that's how we could go in and manage it. But we are building a web server here, so we want to enable HTTP access, and we want to enable HTTPS access. Keep in mind, it'll fill in the port ranges for you, and you could source this traffic from secured subnets. So you could go to the subnets of your organization if that's all you wanted to be able to access this particular web server and you could put those IP address ranges in. We'll let everyone get there by default just out of laziness in our test here. We'll choose review and launch. It says, hey, look, it's open to the world. Yeah, we know that, no problem. And we'll launch this instance. Obviously, we'll choose a key pair. You can choose the AD server key pair if you have that one, or I created a quick one called My Key. So we'll launch the instance with that key pair, and now we'll scroll down, view our instances, and you may be surprised that not only do you have this one that's pending, spinning up in the subnet that we want, but there's another one that's running, and this is, what is it? It's your NAT instance. Remember, when we created the VPC, we created a NAT instance for the private subnet usage, and that's what that other instance is. Now, notice I was experimenting with my web server earlier, and I terminated those practice instances for this demonstration. Notice they're still hanging around in here, even though they're terminated. Amazon Web Services will clean these up. There's nothing you can do about it. I wanted to show you this. After an hour to three hours, they will drop out of your list of instances. Really nothing you could do. You could filter so they don't show up in the output, but they will permanently go away after some time period. So here is our SysOps Web Server instance, and down here is our public IP. We said we wanted public IPs automatically assigned. I will paste that IP address into the URL area, and sure enough, we are brought to the Amazon Linux M AMI test page. This is the page being served up by the web server. So we just proved we have access to the necessary services of our instance in that public subnet. But those subnets that we're using were created automatically for us as part of the wizard. How would we go in and manipulate the virtual private cloud subnets manually? Well, let's go back to the VPC area. So I go back to the services homepage, choose VPC, and under the subnets area, notice you can manually create subnets. So I'll choose the create subnet, and I'll give this a name tag of sysops, and this will be public subnet2, and notice we can assign this to our first VPC. 
Notice it will automatically be associated with our VPC CIDR block. For an availability zone, we can put it in the 1B so we have some nice load balancing potential down the road in different availability zones, and then we can specify the CIDR block we want to use. Maybe we want to use 10 dot zero dot one dot zero slash 24 for this subnet. We say yes, create, and it says, and I wanted you to see this, oh, sorry, you've got an overlap with private subnet one, so it won't let you make such a mistake. We'll number this two slash 24 and say yes, create, and it's gonna create that just fine. But wait a minute. It is a public subnet. That's what we intend it to be. But would it really be publicly assess accessible? Well, let's take a look. Notice that we are currently looking at that public subnet. And let's move our divider so we can see it. There it is, public subnet 2. And if we look at the route table, notice that the route table is going to be pointing to the instance that is the network address translation instance. We don't want that. We want this public subnet to be pointing to the internet gateway for all of the unknown routes. So we will edit the route table and we'll change it to, drop this list, and it was 0896A372, we'll change it to the other route table that's in existence, and this is pointing to the internet gateway. We'll save this change, and you just made it a public subnet per our purposes. Pretty cool. Let's create one more private subnet, shall we? So we'll go to create subnet. We will name this sysops, and we'll call it private subnet 2. This is in our first VPC. We can see it associates perfectly. This is going to be in the 1B availability zone. And for a CIDR block, we'll do 10.0.3.0 slash 24. And we will create it. And this route table for this subnet will be pointing at the NAT instance by default. And that's exactly what we would want for this other private subnet. Now, I wanted to end this nugget with a look at cleaning things up once you're done with your experimentation. Remember how you would have to do this. You, you have associations between all these objects, don't you? And what you need to do is you need to delete objects that are really the the lowest common denominator, right, of the association, and then you can delete kind of the parent object. So think about it. You have an instance inside of public subnet one. So if we were to go up to subnet actions and attempt to delete this subnet, it would say, no way. It's not going to let you do that because you have instances running inside of it. So just think about that when you go to clean stuff up. You would first need to go to EC2, and in EC2, you would need to go to your running instances and you would need to stop the running instances of the NAT server. You would need to stop the running instance of your web server and terminate those. Once they are stopped, then you could delete the subnets. And then once all those subnets are gone, you could delete the VPC. You get the idea. So cleanup can be rather laborious and you must do it in the correct order of operations for it to be successful. In this nugget, you and I experimented with the creation of virtual private clouds that are non-default, obviously, and we saw the creation of subnets inside those. We discussed the making of a subnet that's private, the making of a subnet that's public. We looked at the IP addressing that can be set up for that. There's a NAT device that we can create. There's, of course, the internet gateway created for us, so we have accessibility. We spun up an instance. We put it in one of those subnets. The subnets we arranged arranged in availability zones. A lot was going on in this nugget, and don't be afraid to watch this nugget more than once if all of this is new to you. I hope you found this nugget informative, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.